Welcome everyone to uh, Inspirational Women. Please subscribe to our channel and remember to click the bell so that you can be notified of any new episodes. Joining me today is Patty Beaton, who is the owner of zoofit.net and the author of three books and more as we're going to find out. Welcome, Patty. Thank you for having me. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Let's start with, you know, wh where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in a faraway land from here <laughs> in, uh, in South Carolina. That's where I was actually born and raised. And um, from a very early age, we visited marine life parks, visited zoos, and I pointed to the, the people playing with it, you know, training the dolphins. And I told my mom, that's what I wanted to do when I grow up. And uh, to her credit, I joined the swim team right after that. I think I was the youngest member of the swim team at the time. I was about five. From there, my love for marine life, ocean life, animals just grew. And I, I knew that my home home is in South Carolina, but I knew that, that the world was calling to me. So when I graduated high school, I left South Carolina, moved to Florida, and pursued my dream of being an animal trainer. Good for you. And it's not many people that know what they want to do at such a young age. No. <laughs> you know, usually we're well into our teens and sometimes 20s and 30s and have multiple career changes. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, I am a rare breed and, um, and I do recognize that, that not everyone, and I don't think that's, no, I don't think it's normal. Not, I think it's fine. If you do know what you want, then good, go for it, but it's pretty unique. <laughs> you obtained a degree in psychology from Florida. What was your reasoning for that, knowing that you wanted to take care of animals? Having that dream, I would talk to people in the animal care field, and I talked to a lot of trainers when I would go visit zoos and aquariums. Their, their suggestion was, believe it or not, even though we're dealing with animals, most of them did not have a degree in biology or marine biology. They had, an, they had degrees that dealt with operant conditioning, so um, psychology terms uh, for training for behavioral change. And that was pretty interesting to me. And so when I went to school, I learned, I, I went to psychology to learn again, a little bit more about BF Skinner, operant conditioning and shaping behaviors. And very glad I went that route because what I have learned through school and through my career has helped me create what what we uh, what we do today with ZooFit. Wonderful. Did you do anything between the time you left university and the time that you were at the aquarium in New Orleans? Yeah, I spent six years at SeaWorld as an animal care specialist. We uh, working with their um, on their animal care team, working with rescue and rehabilitating manatees. Um, SeaWorld has the most successful rescue and rehabilitation program on the planet, uh, especially for marine animals. And uh, to date, they've rescued 34,000 marine animals. And so I was part of that team that did rescues of manatees and, and, and dolphins. We also got a chance to work with, with dolphins. I, I cared for them, They're those that were born in the park, and then also uh, uh, other really rare animals uh, to see. <laughs> At SeaWorld, which was the polar bears, we worked with the, with the polar bears, all the marine mammals that were not in the show, I would help take care of. A remarkable experience and, and something that helped me along the way to, to show that you can change your own behavior. And just like with any, any animal that is using positive reinforcement, using positive methods, building a trusting relationship and have, having fun with with uh, with learning these animals that you rescued were they they were injured somewhere and and came to your attention so we worked with fish and wildlife one of their jobs is to again cruise the the coast cruise the the area if they would find a sick injured or orphaned manatee they would give us a call we would go rescue it uh, either untangle it and there were many occasions we would just have to rescue it untangle it or uh, get it out of a situation, just release it back into a safe spot. Um, but again, if it was injured, uh, very frequently they were hit by boats and this would right. do some pretty serious damage to them. And then other times we would get a call that something happened to the mom, the, the, 
Fish and Wildlife weren't sure. Uh, they couldn't find it. They, they would observe it for up to a day before picking it up and bringing it to us. And then we would uh, raise it. And then once it became big enough to be on its own, we would then release it into back into their natural environment. And then you moved to New Orleans. Yeah. Yeah. When I was researching, you know, so I had to look up aviculturist. I hope I'm spelling it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you said it perfectly. <laughs> and um, it, it said that it's a study and care for birds. Yes. But you not only took care of birds, but otters, fish, and other kind of mammals also. Yes. Yeah. Well, how did you enjoy that? What was that experience like? Now that was it was very different animals, but but again, very similar aspect, just utilizing the same principles. Um, but I worked with penguins, some parrots, and a couple of uh, a couple of birds of prey, what we would call owls and a, and a and a hawk. Then I would help out the other aquarists with with whatever they were. Uh, working on so um, helped out with the sharks on occasion we had a sea turtle a couple of sea turtles rescued I'd help out with that um, but my focus was on the sea otters that they had at the aquarium mm -hmm. and all the birds at the aquarium well how do you create an enrichment program for an otter well so first of all enrichment is any activity that keeps the animal mentally and physically active and so we right. have enrichment programs for our cats here at home <laughs> and uh, right. so the same thing goes with with otters knowing a little bit about what their natural behaviors are giving them opportunities to display those natural behaviors so otters like to like to use tools, believe it or not. They use tools to crack open their uh, hard shelled animals like crabs uh, and sea urchins. And so mm -hmm. we would give them treats that rather than they just gobble up, they have to crack open. And then mm -hmm. we would even provide them some tools to do that with. So we would give them ice treats that they could have to bang on the rocks or, right. um, or wrap their, their food in some kelp and some um, some cloth, basically, uh, long strips of cloth that we called kelp. Wrap that up, and then they'd have to kind of figure out how to how to unravel it. Training can be is is definitely considered enrichment as well because it keeps them mentally active, constantly learning some new behavior. So, and then building relationships with these animals. I know it sounds odd. How do you build a relationship with a wild animal? It takes trust. We would do a physical examination on a veterinary examination, just like we would take our cats and dogs, but we were doing this with a 60 pound sea otter that has the bite pressure of a black bear. And we would do this twice a year. So there definitely needs to be some trust to get that animal into a crate and then, right. then get it anesthetized because if we tried to catch them up in a net, that's going to stress them out it's going to stress us out because we're at risk and a very negative, negative feeling. So training, it, it helps enrich them, but it also helps help take care of them too. Right. It was amazing to me because, you know, I was looking on YouTube and uh, these various websites prior to my conversation with you. And I could see them with the ice. It's just amazing, you know, that who would have thought? I was reading about station training and how that benefits the animal in terms of veterinarian care and whatnot. So there's many different things that we can train animals for. Um, one thing, station training uh, is, is training an animal to sit on one spot. And usually it's in their exhibit. And this is Basically, a really good example of how to work with multiple animals at one time. So if you are dealing with penguins, per, per se, you could station train them so that they're all sitting in their one spot. And then you can tell who got what food much easier than if they're all at a free for all trying to figure out who, who got fed. Uh, so station training can help, again, eliminate chaos <laughs> in, a, in a group uh -huh. setting. Um, it can also, uh, it, it also helps with what, what we might call, again, some, some unwanted behaviors. So, for instance, at home with my cats, my, my younger cat loves to, when I start fixing their food, likes to reach up his paw at the counter and start batting at it. And um, 
And we discovered that actually is tearing up some of the counter. We're like, no, no, <laughs> that's no, <laughs> no bueno. So we station trained him. We basically, you know, taught him to sit on a spot. And that basically tells him, you know, if you sit on the spot, I'm going to fix your food for you. And, uh, and he cannot claw up the counter while he is sitting on his spot. So it, it helps him. It, it helps him realize that he's going to get fed, but it also helps us keep, uh, you know, get our security deposit back, but, but also, uh, you know, it helps us, again, keep, keep some, the chaos down a little bit. The other thing that we can do with animals, and uh, this is really, really helpful. What, again, if you want to train an animal to do anything, the most basic behavior I can suggest is called target training. And this is where, again, I'm going to use my hand as an example. Touch the hand, and then you can, and you get a reinforcement, you get a reward. So you can then move your hand around, and they're going to follow it. So then you can, again, move your hand into a crate and the animal will follow it. You can move your hand onto a scale and the animal will follow it. You can move your hand to a spot wherever you want, hold it still, and if the animal's touching it where you, with the body part you want, you can then examine the rest of the animal because it's holding still. And um, this, this is a game changer for a lot of Animal, you know, again, of course, animal trainers, but even like pet owners, um, if you're if you struggle to get your pet into the into to the vet, into a crate or whatever, target train them and then train them to go into the crate. Use following your hand, um, and the same thing goes for veterinary care. So if they if the vet wants to take a look at an animal's leg and they're moving around the exhibit, it's hard. So then you put them on a target and it's not going to always be our hand. Let's say we're dealing with a tiger. We don't want them touching our hands, <laughs> but, right. uh, but it's going to be, they're going to put their, their nose or put the body part on a target. And then the vet um, is got a free, a free glance. Oh, great. I can get a good look at his leg. I can get a good look at his body stress-free for us. So we don't have to you know, um, we don't have to anesthetize this tiger just to get a look at his leg. It's stress-free for, uh, for, you know, for the tiger because he's used to this type of behavior. He's not like, what's the vet doing back there? There's, you know, um, he's, he's focused on the target and, and, and again, creates positive relationships because all he has to do is super simple, just touch that target and he gets a treat. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And it's a, it's a pretty great way to work with animals. That's wonderful. It's amazing, really. It really is amazing that you can train a tire <laughs> or a wild animal for that matter, truly. Now, you say that you've also um, interacted with the public. And we're still talking about New Orleans here. What did, was that like um, bringing them around the zoo to on a tour or? Yeah, uh, on occasion, um, most zoos are what we would call a nonprofit, meaning that um, that their the money up from the gates goes 100% into the care for the animals. Um, any and usually any leftover money is not is not going to some CEO's pocket. It's going into conservation or research efforts. So these organizations, zoos and aquariums, rely heavily on donors. And um, mm -hmm. one of the things, again, working with some pretty charismatic animals like sea otters and penguins, uh, big popular areas to get a tour if you donated money was to, to visit those animals in, in some capacity. So that was part of dealing with the public. But another thing is, again, working with in zoos and aquariums, the purpose is to educate the public. Yes, right. it's a wonderful, fun outing for families and for, you know, um, I imagine my, my first date at a zoo would be, like that would be a dream. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that anymore, but it's a wonderful, fun place to go. But the true purpose of zoos is conservation, education and conservation of endangered species. So for, on that note, um, wanting to educate the public, we would do keeper 
keeper talks, so talks uh, from the keepers about that particular animal and, um, and then presenting them, you know, to, to the visitors in a mm -hmm. entertain, entertaining and educational informative way, and then inspire them to do what they could to protect those endangered species. I feel that I would be neglectful if I don't ask you the following question. And that is that there are a lot of naysayers in regards to keeping animals in the zoo. And I understand your philosophy of it's an educational thing. So how, how do you respond to someone who says it's cruel to keep an animal locked up? I do have a strong belief that everyone is very much entitled to, to their opinions and, and their I mean, this... This is a very tricky subject and it's also it's like talking about religion or politics to someone I'm like yeah. you know uh, I, I view a certain way I have very passionate about this and nothing you say is going to, to change my mind but uh, so I actually and I will say to to a degree at least on my part listening to them and seeing some of their concerns like what exactly if there's something within my power again besides free the animals. Again, listening to some of their concerns can improve animal care, I believe, in some regards. So if like, you're thinking that, okay, you know, elephants, for example, they need a lot of space. Yes, they do actually require, they're a big animal, even though they don't need to roam hundreds of miles to search for food in a zoo, they do still need space to, to roam. If that's possible, give elephants the space that they need or give them an opportunity to get the exercise that they require. I do think that again, while we don't have to obey or you know, you give in to any demands that the animal animal that people don't agree with, they can still listen and learn. Maybe that's how I feel about about that. Like, what can we do to improve the the conditions and the welfare of the animal? And that being said, again, I do have this strong belief that. Um, zoos today that goes across all boards have a very important role in inspiring conservation. For me, that that happened with me. It happens with people that I see every single day. I would not be the conservationist. I would not have started Zoo Fit if it weren't for seeing the um, seeing these animals and saying, you know, again, five years of age, mom, that's what I want to do. And mm -hmm. so, if it hadn't been for a zoo. I don't think I would be where we are. People who live in the city would never be exposed to any of those animals and would not, our children would not know anything about them. Now, I would think that by learning about them, their habits, their food requirements and their health requirements in the zoo would also help care for them in the wild. Well, not so much the wild, but in the conservationist areas. Yeah, so again, that goes back to um, saying again, zoo, most zoos, not all of them, but a huge majority of zoos are nonprofit. And that means yeah. their money goes to two things, care of the animals and conservation of those animals. So if the animal mm -hmm. zoo has, if, an, if a zoo has giraffes in their zoo, they are contributing to giraffe conservation. If they have mm -hmm. the same thing, if they have gorillas, they are con they are contributing to gorilla conservation. And in many many cases, many animals would be completely extinct if it were not for zoos. There are some animals, very small, that people just don't even realize. Uh, the Oregon spotted frog, the western pond turtle, and the silver spot butterfly are local species to Washington and Oregon that would be eradicated completely if it were not for zoo captive breeding programs. But even on a bigger scale, you have animals like the California condor, the Chevalsky's horse, and the scimitar horned oryx that went extinct in the wild. Had not been for zoos, zoos started a California condor breeding program, and now there are 85 or, or 285 condors in the wild. Wouldn't be possible. Mm -hmm. Again, it, it, can't, it cannot be a black and white. You cannot say no zoos. And, and because we, we understand that there is importance. But it also, again, there, there does have to be 
Now, again, if you had that valid concerns about the animal welfare, I feel that zoos could pay attention and, and do that to improve animal care. Mm -hmm. And then you moved up to the Seattle uh, Woodland Park Zoo. Yes. How did that come about? Well, I refer to the Space Needle as the mothership that finally called me home. <laughs> this was your destination all along? I don't know. It was just, it was really just a shot in the dark. I don't know. I don't think we like threw a dart, so to speak, but we were just like, okay, we've been in Florida, we've been in Louisiana, we've been in South Carolina and it's hot. Where do we want to go? We're like, where it's not hot. <laughs> so we're like, and Washington, let's go to Washington. And, um, yeah. And so we hit Washington, discovered that was the smartest move we had ever made in our lives. We absolutely love it up here in Washington. And uh, the people, again, they, they, I feel like they are, they're my tribe and it's been a really, really good fit. So yeah. The you say that this was like, has been the most incredible job you've ever had. Yes. How so? Well, the, I, again, my entire career was so focused on marine animals that I tended to have blinders on when it came to land animals. At Woodland Park Zoo, they don't have a lot of marine animals. They have some penguins, they have flamingos, that's about it. <laughs> they, they, uh, yeah. they, have, they have land animals, you know. So my repertoire grew just significantly, but beyond that, I learned about so much other aspects of conservation. Again, my blinders were climate change and sustainable seafood, per perhaps. Learning more about the wider, the bigger picture. Learning about the, the dangers of palm oil and um, the deforestation that is involved with palm oil with our single, our single paper products, single use paper products, and just dozens of other aspects. And that really opened my eyes and it grew to uh, to help me make a better connection to uh, to what I can do to make the world a better place. But most importantly for me, again, it wasn't just the animals. It was amazing. I got to work with elephants. I got to work with primates, um, monkeys, and some orangutans, and siamongs, and birds, and reptiles, which were actually really amazingly really fun to to work with i didn't just work with amazing animals but this is where zoo fit began for me it was just a matter of i had this dream job i've been doing it for 10 15 years and it was just it was taking its toll on my body and the, the strong tendency for animal care professionals not just zookeepers but people in the animal care field we have a tendency to put so much to the animals that mm -hmm. we, we tend to neglect our own care. And that was definitely where I was at that, at that point. I just came to this realization while working with the animals that how, I can't take care of these animals until I'm taking care of myself. Good that, point. But if we go back to your role in the, the zoo, you say that you were on the husbandry committee. What? does a husbandry committee do and what was your role there? Well, we were, uh, so husbandry is the overall care basically of, of the animals. So when we do a vet procedure, that's definitely husbandry care. But when we train them for that husbandry procedure, once again, again, so that they're calm and um, right. cooperative, that also is part of that care. It's just as important. Having a very strong background in training, starting with SeaWorld, going into aviculture, uh, going into the aquarium and working with elephants, having this strong training background. We wanted to help other keepers with, uh, throughout the country. I, I joined the Behavioral Husbandry Committee. So it's not just about training. It's again, as I mentioned, we did enrichment. So anything right. that, that People may struggle with, hey, I'm wanting to, I'm wanting to improve, you know, animal welfare through our enrichment program. Do we have any suggestions and just the animal welfare in general? So uh, helping helping other keepers out as a just as a resource for uh, for them to shoot ideas and also to give them give them ideas. And you were mentoring others at the same time. Yeah, so that, that was on a national level through an organization called Association, American Association of Zookeepers or AAZK. But in the zoo itself, we had a, another committee 
uh, for you know for the zookeepers within Woodland Park Zoo, and mm -hmm. uh, again wanting to be a, of help and service, <laughs> we created some templates for training. So again, if somebody wanted to train an any animal like a pig or or a gorilla to step onto a scale what were some basic steps that they could take if they were really struggling with an issue there would be someone on their team that could potentially help out and help troubleshoot that in that situation and you branched out also into professional writing of mm -hmm. blogs and other articles were those published or just for the zoo itself yeah, most of the time, yeah, I, I still, um, I still work with uh, the AAZK and um, and publishing some of their. Uh, they publish to about five to ten thousand zookeepers around the country, and again, helping them out as best as I can, and <laughs> yeah, them by by sharing some ideas that I had, uh, such as I created an enrichment device for the elephants using old boat fenders or boat bumpers. I do. Oh. I created new enrichment for the elephants, and it was so popular and so so effective that I felt more animals can benefit from this. So I wrote an article about that. And then previously last year, we got hit with COVID, and zookeepers. Mm -hmm were really hit hard. Some of them lost their jobs. Some of them were had to do double work um, because the zoo was closed. It was really hard for them. So I wrote an article on here are some healthy ways to deal with coronavirus in a positive, positive way. So any way I can help the yeah, animal care professionals, I, I, I do strive to, to, to shine, as, you know, again, as a, as a, as a resource for them. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a good segue into what you're doing now. You stated that you found you needed to take better care of yourself in order to take care of the animals and that you found it very physically demanding. That was sort of the little seed that prompted this next adventure? Oh yes, as I mentioned, I, I call it my lightning moment. It was lightning had struck my brain, just the whole idea. I'm like, if I take better care of myself, I'll have the energy, I'll have the focus, I'll have the strength, the endurance to do this job. This job is very demanding. It's very, very prone to burnout and what we call in the field, compassion fatigue. If you don't take care of yourself, you cannot show up for the animals. And that was, that again, that lightning lightning moment for me, the epiphany. And when I did go on that journey, I decided I've gone down this path before and it's, it always just kind of fizzles out in the end. So this time let's do things just a little bit differently. Um, yeah, I'm doing this for the animals. So let's do it like the animals. And so I started applying those positive reinforcement techniques. I started shaping my own behavior, putting myself on a target and all intent and purposes, basically put myself on a target and then move myself around uh, um, in, in simplistic terms. But I also used enrichment. I used uh, games and items you know, to, to help make working out engaging and fun um, to keep me physically, uh, physically active. But the thing that just threw me for myself for a loop and just really made the biggest difference was the zoos are there for conservation. And I started making these little, little bridges, these little connections between my healthy habits and conservation efforts. And that made the biggest difference to me. Um, so it wasn't just, I started, I, I didn't, I didn't start like eating healthy just for me, it was eliminating plastic waste. It was eliminating the palm oil that is in about 75% of our processed foods. It was, again, eliminating eating more locally sourced foods so that wasn't traveling so far. And it was also cutting out a lot of the fast food that uses single-use plastics and single-use paper products, which contribute to deforestation. All these things were swirling around, helped me be a much healthier person. I had a very huge, my personal significant impact on the environment. And that's where you coined the phrase conservation fitness. That is, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that phrase, uh, I'm hoping it's going to take over the world, <laughs> but, uh, but it is also, I consider, it's almost the forefront of 
what will be the future of conservation. I believe that the future of conservation is showing people what they get out of these conservation acts. Saving the planet, great, because we don't have any fun things that we want without a planet. I mean, I want to have a, I want to own a million dollar home. Great, you don't have one without a, without a planet. However, that's beyond that. How can I, how can I benefit by protecting the planet? You can lose weight. You can meet your health goals. You can increase your energy. You can, you can, again, if you want to sleep better, if you want to, <laughs> let's go, let's go big. <laughs> you have a better sex life, you know, have, have, have these healthy habits that promote mm -hmm. conservation in the long run also. And in this um, new endeavor, you've also written three books. Okay, let's talk about those. First book that you wrote was Exercise Guide and Reuse, Recycle. Am I getting that right? Yeah, Reuse, Recycle, Reduce Your Waste. Reduce Your Waste, that was in 2018. Okay, what's that one all about? So uh, the Exercise Guide was basically, um, again, as a fit, I had become a fitness consultant and I would do, I would do fitness classes, um, you know, uh, for, for parks and recs. And I would also do some for a local CrossFit gym. And I just liked having fun. I didn't like, again, I didn't want to be like, we're going to do a squat. Uh, it, I mean, <laughs> squats are great. They are a really, really good exercise, but I don't know something about it. It's just like a squat. Okay. What, what, anything else? <laughs> and so I started playing around and I found that a lot of these movements resemble kind of animal movements and, and um, uh -huh. just having some fun with the names and, and then relating them to animals. And again, being zoo fit, that makes sense that I would do animal movements and uh, having some fun. I created a, a whole book that has these animal exercises in them. And then taking it a step further, I said, hey, let's have some fun with some workouts to incorporate these exercises. And I called those the conservation hero workouts, honoring some of our favorite conservation heroes, such as uh, Steve Irwin, Cousteau. So those are all you know, marine, marine right. movements and several others throughout the book that uh, help you learn a little bit more about conservation, appreciate animals, and just have fun with your fitness. And then the reuse, recycle, reduce your waste goes perfectly in line again with enrichment again saving money on gym equipment saving and having fun with your workout and also uh, helping keep trash out of the landfill so I started making workout equipment from household items we had a, a pair of ripped jeans that we just could not donate there was no saving these jeans we couldn't donate them to the thrift store so we were going to throw them away but then i i thought about hey what if we stuffed these jeans the pant legs with with uh with sand with ba bags of sand and bag and so we tried that out and that was a lot of fun. And then we had a busted um, basketball that wouldn't hold any air. And we're like, you know, there's these exercise equipment called medicine balls. A lot of, lot of gyms use. What if we use this, med this basketball, filled that with sand and made our own medicine ball. And so I started collecting these things, practicing. And now we have a whole home gym in our home made from household items to keeping them out of the landfills. And we love using them because we made them. <laughs> so um, Yes, of course. And it's, it's, it's money saving also. It, for the ball in general can cost you somewhere upwards of 40, $50 and you can make one for about right. six. <laughs> what about your do fit safari book that yeah. you authored in 2019? This is my latest one and super excited about this. And I'm glad that you, you, we're talking about it because uh, this was this is just a culmination of a lot of the questions I get as a as a zookeeper as a conservationist and then now as a fitness consultant and that is what's the best thing for me to do and again on the zookeeper side it was what's the best thing for me to do to to protect the planet or to protect fill in the fill in the blank with your favorite animal that's a very <laughs> it's a very tricky question because it really it depends what can you do? Can you install um, solar panels in your windows or in, on your home? If, if not, then that's not the best movement for you. Can you walk to the store? Yes, then great. That's something you can do. Again, it really depends what can you, what can you do. It's going to be different for each and every person. 
And the same thing with fitness, like what's the best diet? What's the best exercise? And my response was always the one that you, uh, that you enjoy, that you can sustain for, for mm-hmm. life. The, the two key words there is sustainable. What's sustainable for you and what's sustainable for the planet? What can, what is your best impact? And those, that question just kept uh, swirling my mind and went, and I was, we were creating a fitness a fitness challenge for the CrossFit box I was at. And I, I decided let's, let's branch out and not just, not just uh, give them one specific thing for them to need that they need to do for the whole month. Let's give them a variety uh, um, to see what works for you. If paleo, uh, paleo is again, going to what we call the caveman diet. So before the agriculture revolution, no grains, no legumes, no dairy. If that works for you, great, but it doesn't work for everybody. Right. Um, Going vegetarian. If the thought of not eating meat for the rest of your life fills you with dread, then that is not the diet for you. (laughs) Trying a bunch of different things and and then finding what is your way. And this kind of evolved to the Zoofit Safari. So I I show people, I give them a five, five weeks, it's five different diets. We go through the vegetarian diet, the keto diet, very low carb. Uh, we go through the uh, Mediterranean diet, the paleo, and then what we call the locavore diet, which is eating as locally sourced as you can and eating seasonally food. But along the way, we're also going to explore um, different exercise routines. So does strength training speak to you? Does, um, does, does cross training, does Pilates speak to you? Which, what works for you? And then we also, most important for me, is we find these connections to conservation. So we're not just going to find your way to fitness, we're gonna find your way to conservation fitness, um, having your best impact on your health and on the environment. Which is your favorite? My favorite? I have a very special, uh, I I think for me personally, I I lean towards Mediterranean with um, with a hint of locavore. I really, enjoy eating locally produced foods um mm-hmm. and uh but the mediterranean it, it's it's just a very a very open there's no restrictions there's no no drinking no no grains no right. grains. if you want yeah. grains, have grains if you want meat have some meat um but uh it's again it's about it's not even more about what you're eating it's about how you're eating and that's what i really love about mediterranean it really focuses not on what you're eating, but how we are consuming the food. And for mm-hmm. me, I like the, the Mediterranean Week and the Zoofit Safari because it relates, it connects you to the palm oil crisis. And um, so teaching you, and that was basically the very, very beginnings of Zoofit was, uh, was learning about how palm oil is in so much of our processed foods. And if we just cut out processed foods and focus on whole, clean, organic foods, then we can have, again, significant impact on, on, uh, on environmental uh, issues and challenges. So yeah, I think for me personally, it might be the Mediterranean week. Yeah, I like that one too. And do you cover any of these things on your uh, YouTube channel? I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't cover a lot of it on uh, my public YouTube channel. I do cover some of these oh. things on a, on, in a on, on unlisted in a couple of different capacities. And, and thank you for asking about this. Um, I do have a what we call a Zoofit Safari Challenge, and mm-hmm. uh, so that will that gives you the whole Zoofit bundle, and also uh, it gives you a five week opportunity to uh, to access. Um, some of the videos, so I do workouts. I also do um, cooking demonstrations, and I give master classes on these topics re- relevant mm-hmm. to the Zoofit Safari. And uh, and so we do have one coming up. But if it, if you miss, if you're watching this and you missed the Zoofit Safari challenge, we'll have we have we do this about four or five times a year. So you can go to zoofit.net and find out when the next one is available. Um, what next one is available that you can join. So that, that gives you one option. Another option is we have started a Patreon page. And uh, again, joining the Patreon, 
we give you some added bonuses. And again, very often these classes aren't mm -hmm. included. Um, again, how to connect our, our habits with conservation and also how to just have a little bit more fun with it. That's that's very important. Yeah. Ranch Doe, you're doing your YouTube channel. You've got your books. Your things are going pretty well for you. We're on our way, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Where do you see yourself going from here, Patty? What's the future look like? Well, again, I'm, I'm hoping to, again, get that, get conservation fitness, uh, kind of a, 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 a movement uh, of sorts where people kind of become used to that term and seeing that as yes, this is this is something a big a big deal that uh, most people haven't put the two together and now they can uh, now they becomes I won't say a household name but uh, but a common a common theme a common trend for for people who want to make a difference in their lives and on um, on the planet. I do also have uh, ambitions. We are, my husband and I are working together on a, on a brand new book um, called Fandom Fitness. If you check out my YouTube page, um, you, you will see we have tons of videos. My husband is an artist, and so he is making drawings oh. for all of these uh, fandoms. And then Wonderful. creative energy is creating fun workouts <laughs> so we can go on adventures with our favorite heroes. And this still is zoo fit because again, it's that enrichment. It's making fitness fun. It's very engaging. Creating these uh, workouts, the fandom fitness workouts to go on adventures with your favorite characters, your favorite heroes, and then unleash your own inner hero as well. So that's going to be coming out in fall of 2021, fall of this year. Mm -hmm. And um, and then again, I have, if you, I, I did do a, a count, I have about 20 books <laughs> <laughs> roaming around my head. So right. we're, we're hoping the next five years, you're going to see a lot more of ZooFit on, in your book, in your bookstores and, um, and in your book, on your bookshelves too. Well, you sound like a very creative couple. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> of you, you've got it all covered. And we're going to include all your links, Patty, below the the video so that people can reference them and uh, go check it out. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining me today. And I'll look forward to future conversations, more books, more conversations. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.